Hello everyone, my name is Bartolome Celli and I'm a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School working at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in the Pulmonary Division. The topic I shall be addressing for you today is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And my hope is that when we finish this lecture, you will agree that it is a preventable disease above everything else. But because many people do have it and manifest clinical symptoms from it, I would like to convince you that it's also a treatable disease. As a disclaimer, I do not have any stocks or do not own any company. I do not take tobacco funds. You can see the companies with whom I have worked in our division for COPD research, and I do serve on advisory boards of companies that do make some of the medications that are used in COPD. However, they have not influenced at all my presentation. All the slides are taken from the literature and are of my own making. And this is the objective of my lecture. First, I would like to convince you that it is a big problem, a problem that you should know about that it progresses over a long period of time, and the windows that we have of therapy should be instituted as early as possible once the diagnosis is made. <clears throat> Secondly, I'd like to convince you that patients do respond to the therapy that we have. I will be addressing particularly bronchodilators and anti-inflammatories as the cornerstone of therapy. I will talk a bit about new agents and new approach, and I will give you at the end a set of conclusions. So let me start with the fact that it is a big problem. And for that, what I'm gonna do is take the Global Burden of Disease website, which you can access, and I have accessed it this month. What I'm showing you here is mortality from many diseases, and in a very unique type of graphic, I shall be showing you the difference between the rate of death per 100,000 people between 1990 and 2013 for the whole world. You will see this box that has different colors. In sort of fleshy, pinkish color, you have the communicable diseases, diseases that used to be the scourge of mankind. As you can see, that whole box is smaller than the blue one although still larger than the green boxes, and it represents primarily infectious diseases seen in the third world. The size of each box within that gives you the proportion that they represent in terms of total world death. To the left you see, I mean, I'm sorry, to the bottom you see the green boxes, they represent deaths attributable to injuries, and they can be self-inflicted, road, falls, drowning, and fire, and unfortunately, they still represent a very decent size of our deaths, and all of them are indeed preventable. But what is becoming really important is to your left, which are the diseases that are non-communicable in origin. They're usually complex diseases caused by many different factors, and within that, I would like to point out that the third biggest cause of death represented by the yellow box in here is that of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So for the whole world, there are many, many deaths attributable to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and this will be the center of our attention today. So I hope I've convinced you it is a big problem. <clears throat> Indeed. It is so big that if we look at large studies like Platino and Bold, done in many, many countries, you will see that per 100 population, the line hovers, I'm sorry, let me go back, the line hovers around 10%. Now, what I want you to notice is that for some countries, such as the United States here, Austria, Australia, Iceland, the pink line that represents women actually has a higher prevalence than that of men. And as more women begin to take up the, the habit of smoking, we will see this becoming a problem for even less developed countries. Overall, between eight and 10% of subjects in the world will have obstructive spirometry if you do a survey. So it is highly prevalent. Unfortunately, 
It is poorly diagnosed, and for that I'm using this data from Joan Soriano, which represents data from the same studies that I showed you before, and you will see this graph. This graph shows the different countries on the x-axis and columns that have two colors, light blue and dark blue. The light blue are those patients that, or those subjects that had spirometric obstruction and knew or had a diagnosis of COPD. In blue, which is the largest portion of each and every column, irrespective of any country, are those subjects who had obstruction on a spirometry but were undiagnosed. So in essence, it remains a highly prevalent disease and unfortunately underdiagnosed. And this represents a big problem because in order for you to address therapy, you first need to make a diagnosis. So I would like to ask you, which of this is true for COPD? A, is in the world progressive? B, does respond to pharmacotherapy. C, exacerbations are rare and cause little problems. Or D, it is difficult to diagnose. Well, certainly, as I hope I will convince you through this talk, the right answer is B. The disease does respond to pharmacotherapy. As far as answer number A or letter A is, not all patients progress. C, as we will see at the end of my talk, exacerbations are frequent and cause a lot of problems. And D, COPD is easy to diagnose using a spirometry. Now, smoking is still a problem, and it is the most important problem facing developed countries. It is also a rising and very important problem in underdeveloped countries, although pollution remains a big problem in certain pockets of the world where wood smoke and biomass is used. I would like to show you on the right that if we take appropriate steps, the prevalence of smoking can decrease. And this is New York City since 1993 to 2015, 2010, I'm sorry. I want you to see that as we have instituted public policies like increasing tax, campaigns against smoking, the prevalence has decreased until it's reached about 13%, which is quite an achievement. It's all, we've almost cut in half the prevalence of smoking. More efforts should lead to a smokeless society, and this should result in further improvement in COPD and also lung cancer and other diseases associated with smoking. Unfortunately, industry has responded with a new addictive form of providing nicotine, and those are the electronic cigarettes. The electronic cigarettes very smartly package a bit of nicotine. It is hit by a laser beam with energy from a battery, and you get a smoke that is loaded with nicotine that has and can be used as a substitute for cigarette. It is sold in many, many places, it has very attractive name. It is called vaping, and it uses techniques that have been useful for cigarettes, which are good-looking young individuals who become attractive to youngsters. And indeed, this industry has become so potent that in 2013, it already sold about a billion dollars in, in e-cigarettes for that year, and is actually increasing year by year. Now, perhaps the danger of this is shown on the next slide, where you have an editorial from the New England Journal of Medicine that portrays the uptake of electronic cigarettes in dark blue on this graph. On the x-axis is middle school students, high school students, 2011, 2012, and the percentage of individuals who view cigarettes or electronic cigarettes. What I want you to see is the dark portion of those columns showing how many young individuals, mean age 12, 13 years, or in this case 10 to 12 years, are using electronic cigarettes. The zealots will say that we should suppress any sale of electronic cigarettes. The more moderates claim that it may be a way to uh, substitute cigarettes. However, I want you to know that analysis of the content of those electronic packages of nicotine contain many substances that could be harmful to the lungs. 
And finally, since nicotine is very addictive, it may be a way to safely, or in, with a word safely within brackets, be sold as a better than cigarette substitute that is harmless when in all reality it is already creating addiction. Now, COPD progresses over a long period of time. And this is shown on this slide that was from a paper that was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine. What I'm going to show you here is data from three cohorts, the framing of offspring cohort, the, long, the uh, Lovelace smoking cohort, and the uh, Copenhagen City Heart Study, in which cohorts were followed over time to see their progression of COPD. On the right, you'll see years on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, proportion. This is the FEV1 value beginning at baseline. Now from birth to the end of life, there is a course in lung function that is depicted here. The data from this study applies to the solid lines. The data from the dotted lines is taken from values in the literature. And what this says is that there are periods of growth and periods of decay. We are born with airways, and then the alveoli develop, we increase the size of the lungs, and we reach a so-called more or less normal range at about the age of 20, perhaps a little earlier in females than in males. And you could have a lung that is not developed to a, its optimal value, but is still more or less within normal limits. Beyond that, you can decline normally, as shown here by the green line, or you can decline rapidly, as shown here by the red line. If you happen to be a person who smokes and is susceptible to cigarette smoke, even if you have normal and very large lungs at the beginning, your rapid decay can lead you to have COPD. Even more at risk are those individuals whose development is not totally normal and they reach a lower level. If they do not smoke or are not susceptible, it is likely that they will not develop COPD even if they have relatively smaller lungs. But if you had a susceptibility and you decline rapidly, you will have even a bigger chance of developing this disease. So you can get to COPD through two basic mechanisms. One, rapid decline of your lung function over time if you are susceptible, or two, poor development of lung function with relatively normal decline that makes you at high risk of having COPD towards the end of your lifetime. Now, let me convince you <clears throat> that patients do respond to therapy. And for that, I'm going to take the results from one study called the Uplift study, in which 6,000 patients were given, with an FEV1 of one liter, which is fairly severe, were given two bronchodilators, albuterol, or ipratropium bromide, the two of them separated by 30 minutes. What I'm showing you here on the x-axis is the FEV1 milliliters change, increase or decrease, and the proportion of patients who had that response. Fortunately for us, over 50% of the patients had more than 200 milliliters in increase in the FEV1. This is close to 20%, 17% to be very precise. And that is a, a positive and optimistic view of how patients do respond in spite of having very severe obstruction. The minimally clinically important difference for COPD is thought to be 100 milliliters, so you can see that the majority of patients fall to the right of that line. Interestingly, they fall more on certain values than in other. On the left, we have the FEV1 response without changing the FEC depending on the goal stage. Moderate COPD, severe COPD, very severe COPD. And you can see that whether you represent the outcome as increasing 15% in the FEV1 or 12% plus 200 milliliters, the more severe patients do not respond as well in terms of airflow obstruction than the less severe patients in yellow. However, when you look to the right and you now look at the vital capacity response rather than the degree of obstruction, you can see that many patients respond in the most severe stage of COPD, whether you express it as a proportion of the baseline value 
or as a smaller proportion plus 200 milliliters. What does it mean clinically? What it means is that bronchodilators do not just increase your flow, but they also deflate you. Deflate people who are overly inflated. And this is the reason why the vital capacity has a bigger signal than the FEV1 when it is measured in the most severe patients. That decrease in hyperinflation is associated with improvement in shortness of breath. <clears throat> now, as I will present to you the majority of the data based on lung function changes, I'd like to express to you that lung function changes measured with the FEV1 also relate to perception, exacerbations, and quality of life. This is what's represented here in this study from Paul Jones. Transitional dyspnea index, which is shortness of breath. St. George's questionnaire, which is a questionnaire of health-related quality of life with better or improved values showing better quality of life. And here's the number of exacerbations. I'm gonna concentrate in the middle, which is the quality of life. In this, with this tool, a lower value is better. And I, what I want you to see is that as the FEV1 goes up, the quality of life improves as shown by decreasing these lines. As your FEV1 decreases, your quality of life gets worse, which as I told you in this questionnaire is an increase in the value. So as I speak of lung function, I will assume that the changes in lung functions are related to improvements in quality of life. Now let me show you the results of two large trials. The first one is a TORCH trial where they tried fluticasone salmeterol, an inhaled steroid, and a bronchodilator over three years, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled, 6,000 patients, and the outcome was mortality. There were four arms here. The primary comparator was the combination versus the placebo. I'm showing you here there was no impact on mortality. However, there was a, a, an improvement in FEV1 of about 100 milliliters. Remember what I told you about the MCID. There was an improvement in exacerbations which were reduced by 25% and an improvement in the St. George's question of about three units. So this study, even though the primary endpoint did not reach statistical significance, did show that you can improve patients in several domains simultaneously. Now, there is a risk of giving inhaled steroids, especially at higher doses, and it is that it predisposes patients to pneumonia. These are the two arms containing fluticasone versus the arms without fluticasone, and there was over the three years about a 20% chance of having a, a pneumonia, although this was not a risk for increased mortality. Now, who gets pneumonia? Older individuals who are very thin and are very obstruction and have infected sputum. So bottom line, if you're gonna use inhaled steroids, make sure these are not the individuals who fit these guidelines. The second study I'm gonna show you is called the Uplift trial, also 6,000 patients, four years. I've represented it in the same way I did for TORCH, and after four years, the utilization in this case of a once-a-day potent bronchodilator, teatropium, resulted in a 100 milliliter improvement in FEV1, 16% reduction in exacerbations, and an improvement in the quality of life. So these two large trials do show you that bronchodilating or using inhaled steroids plus a bronchodilator improve outcomes in patients with COPD. So I'm gonna ask you, patients with COPD, A, respond poorly to pharmacotherapy, B, are best treated with bed rest and limitation of activities, C, are usually detected early, D, rarely exacerbate, and E, frequently improve over time. Well, I think that from what I've told you, the correct response is respond poorly to, uh, 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 I'm sorry, frequently improve over time. They do not respond poorly to pharmacotherapy, as I have shown you. We will address the issue of rehabilitation, but bed rest and limitations of activities may not be a wise uh, intervention. Unfortunately, they're not detected early. Most of them are detected late, as I told you. And in the end, I'll talk to you about exacerbations, which are frequent. 
Let me show you another trial. This one compared twice a day medication, in this case a beta agonist, with once a day teotropium in 7,000 patients. And what you will see here is that it is better to give medications that have a longer action, specifically the long-acting long acting antimuscarinic, the teotropium, which had a lower exacerbation rate than the twice a day salmitrol. So it would appear that providing the medications was, once a day is better than giving it twice a day, although this is not totally clear for every medication. I will then address, would it be better to mix the medications that I've talked about? Are two better than one? And there is no question that if you look at the overall response, as shown in this study where formoterol was combined with teotropium, there is a better response. And the combination is shown here as the higher line of lung function, in this case for vital capacity over 24 hours, compared to formoterol alone or teotropium alone. So indeed, in every study that has been done, there is a significant improvement in the lung function, which is, uh, you know, maybe 40, 50 cc's more of FEV1 at any given point than either medication alone. In this case, we're comparing the eumeclidinium plus almiterol versus teatropium or placebo, and again, you can see that the combination shown here as the upper two lines are a lot better than placebo, close to 200 milliliters, and are better than either agent alone. Could it be that three are better than two? And I'm talking about adding ICS. This is not as clear, but there is some hint in the literature as shown by this study from the Canadian group headed by Sean Aaron, where teatropium, the long-acting muscarinic agent, was compared with placebo, I'm sorry, alone plus placebo, two drugs, teatropium salmitrol, or three drugs, teatropium salmitrol fluticasone. What I'm showing you here is that there was no difference in exacerbation rate, so it would appear that for that outcome it didn't make a difference. But if you looked at the FEV1 on the y-axis here, triple was better than single and marginally better than double. So yes, for patients who are not doing well, it would be worthwhile to try the addition of a third drug in order to maximize bronchodilatation. This study by Tobias Welty compared teatropium versus triple, and you can see that triple was better than single agent, in this case by a decrease over three months in about 60% in the rate of exacerbations. Now, we were happily cruising through life with two long-acting bronchodilators that were given twice a day, salmeterol and formoterol. However, there have been changes in the molecule which have now allowed us to make medications, long-acting beta agonists that go on for 24 hours, all of them available to you in the United States and certainly in other parts of the world, indacaterol, olodaterol, vilanterol. With these two, not quite as developed, although carmoterol is present in some parts of Europe. And these are very potent bronchodilators, as shown here for indacaterol. In this double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial, the two doses of indacaterol were compared to placebo, and you can see that you get a change of about 200 milliliters maintained over the one-year study compared to placebo. And this was associated with an improvement in quality of life as shown by the white boxes here in the same St. George's questionnaire where a clinically significant improvement is measured at minus four units. And you can see that placebo hung around the no improvement, whereas the medication showed a significant drop in that value over time. There were no important adverse side effects, and this is important for you because it's been thought that beta agonists could kill individuals. In all of these trials, these 24-hour specific beta agonists are, uh, have been very safe. Exacerbations decreased by 14%, and in the U.S., the approved dose is 75 micrograms twice a day. If we compare a beta agonist of long action against the teatropium as done in this study by Buell, you can see that both are equally effective in producing bronchodilatation with changes of about 160 milliliters for the FE1 and about almost 300 for the vital capacity. So they're more or less equipotent 
although there is much more experience with teatropium than there is with the long-acting beta agonist. I'm gonna finish showing you the Velanterol, which is one of the ones that I showed before, to show to you that compared with placebo, you get this significant effect, again, of about 200 milliliters that lasts for about 24 hours. Now, we had one lama, which was the hypotropium bromide. This is long-acting muscarinic agent. And what I can tell you is that since the advent of teatropium about 10 years ago, which became the 400-pound gorilla, some other gorillas have shown in the jungle. And now we have glycopyronium, which is given by one of the medications available in the market, the eumeclidinium also available in the market, and the aclidinium twice a day that is also available in the market. All of these are potent bronchodilators. Actually, they're as potent as teatropium. I'm gonna show you the aclidinium data from the Attain study. Notice that it gives you a significant bronchodilatation, about 160 milliliters compared with placebo shown here by the open boxes, and it also improves your quality of life over four units as shown here to the right of this graph. No difference in side effects versus placebo and the dyspnea index is significantly improved. Now I'm going to show you the comparison between aclidinium twice a day versus teatropium and placebo in a crossover study lasting uh, two weeks. And here is the three lines. Placebo showed no change in, in the baseline FEV1, whereas you can see that the aclidinium given twice a day, the black line is as good or slightly more favorable than the teatropium once a day. All of these differences are not clinically significant. So for practical purposes, twice a day long-acting muscarinic agent is as potent as once a day gold standard teatropium, and certainly better than placebo. Now, addition of these medications is certainly more effective. I'm gonna show you here the GLOW study comparing teatropium with glycopyronium, and you can see that glycopyronium, another llama, is slightly better in this trial, although I want you to see that the cut here increases or magnifies those difference. It was 1.5 versus 1.44, so slightly better in this study the glycopyronium, one of the medications I show you, compared with the atropium. Now, where do we go from here? We can combine llama plus lava, put them in one canister. And this is depicted here in this cartoon, the gorilla body and a lion's face. Or we can give them separate in two different canisters, but one following the other. And certainly, the companies have produced exactly that. Some products, like for motorol aclidinium, are twice a day, for motol or glycopyrrolate twice a day, olodaterol teatropium once a day, umeclidinium vilanterol once a day, indacaterol glycopyronium once a day. All of these medications are currently available to you in the market, and it is your decision whether to use the once a day combinations, the twice a day, or even each of those individual drugs independent of each other, as has been our custom until now. Now, there is no question that two will provide you a better lung function than one. What we have here is a study called the SHINE study, randomized double-blind placebo, 2,000 patients, 26 weeks, an FE1 of about 1.5 liters, and this study compared placebo, teotropium, glycopyronium, indacaterol, and the combination of indacaterol and glycopyronium. No question that the three bronchodilators alone perform extremely well against placebo with differences of about 120 milliliters, but you gain an extra amount, in this case 70 milliliters, by combining the two bronchodilators, in this case, indacatrol and glycopyronium. And this is repeated in other studies where you can have Medications that can improve when given combined, as shown here by the two lines up on top, compared to the lines of individuals at the bottom, at a value, in this case, of about 100 milliliters difference between the combination and the single drug. Even though the dyspnea improves compared to 
when you use placebo, there are very minimal differences in the perception of dyspnea and exacerbation rate. So you gain lung function, you gain a bit of the perception, the benefits of perception, and a marginal effect on exacerbation rate, but it may be worth the effort. Finally, I'm using and comparing theatropium and olodatrol versus theatropium alone, since theatropium is so widely used. Again, the same kind of trial, randomized with patients that fit the bill for this therapy. And what I want you to see is that you do gain area under the curve for FEV1 when you use the combination compared to theatropium alone. In this case, the quality of life improved by about two units. So again, as I told you, the magnitude of improvement in the lung function outstrips the magnitude of improvement in the quality of life. Now, the other group of medications is long-acting bronchodilators and inhaled corticosteroids. I've depicted this as an anti-inflammatory agent and this as a bronchodilator. This is a combination that was present in the TORCH trial. Now, because medications can be given once a day, this particular study compared Vilanterol and fluticasone furoate once a day versus fluticasone and salmeterol twice a day. Again, same type of study, in this case, a duration of 12 weeks. And on the right, I want you to see that as I showed you for the once a day theotropium plus formoterol compared with single agents alone, the combination of once a day was slightly better in the FAV1 compared to the medication twice a day. So if you have it available, if the cost is appropriate and your decision is to give a beta agonist plus inhaled steroid, a once a day preparation may be worth thinking. The difference was 1.3 units and the rate of pneumonia was similar for the two products. Now, is it better to bronchodilate or to give anti-inflammatories? There are several studies that address this. I'm showing you one called the Illuminate, where fluticasone salmeterol twice a day was compared with glycopyronium in the catarol once a day. And you can see here that the pre-dose trough FEV1 at week 12 and week 26 was higher in the bronchodilator than in the single bronchodilator plus steroids. It does make sense that if you give two bronchodilators, you get more bronchodilatation than if you give one plus an anti-inflammatory. And the results are not doubtful. This has been repeated with several products and indeed has resulted in studies that try to compare ICS LABA versus LABA LAMA. One of them is the WISDOM trial where patients who were on triple therapy and had one exacerbation before uh, the year of enrollment were then enrolled to receive double or triple therapy, LABA-LAMA or ICS-LABA. Now this was a double blind, one year trial, 1,000 patients. The steroids were withdrawn over 12 weeks and they were severely affected with an FA1 of 0.9 liters. What I want you to see here is that the difference between LABA-LAMA versus ICS-LABA was 1.3 units in favor of the theatropium. Now, what I want you to see here is the rate of exacerbation was similar. So withdrawing the inhaled steroids did not result in increased exacerbation rate, neither for moderate or for severe. So in terms of exacerbation, it seems to me that both medications have equal power, but I want you to be careful when you withdraw steroids if you're thinking of doing it, because as you will see here, what we have is FEV1 over the same time of period in the same patients. This is the moment, this is the moment you initiate your withdrawal. After 12 weeks, you finish the withdrawal, and there is a drop after you stop the inhaled steroids a mean drop of about 43 milliliters, which was statistically significant, with patients withdrawn from steroids suffering a bigger loss than those that did not. So my advice to you is not, not to withdraw steroids if you think it should be withdrawn, but to make sure that you do follow the uh, lung function to make sure that you're not hurting the patient as you decrease or stop altogether 
the dose of steroids. In this trial, there was no difference in pneumonia incidence, which was one of the reasons why patients may want to have their inhaled steroids withdrawn. There is another study called the FLAME study, where they compared indacatrol glycopyronium versus salmitrol fluticasone, more or less the same kind of study. And what I want you to see is that the rate of exacerbation was, if anything, better shown here in the indacatrol glycopyronium group uh, uh, in blue versus the salmitrol in yellow, whether you looked at any exacerbation, moderate or severe, and very severe. And the hazard ratio and confidence interval was significant for all three. So it seems to, to us that the administration of a lama lava or lava action is actually equally effective than lava ICS to prevent exacerbations in the average patient. Now, we're all doctors and we have to choose the medication for those that we think uh, require one or the other type. There was another big, large trial called the SUMMIT trial, 16,000 patients. The outcome was supposed to be mortality, and this compared the ultra lava vilantrol and fluticasone on survival compared with either component alone or placebo. Unfortunately, there was no benefit of the administration of medication, even though there was a drop in mortality. This was not statistically significant. But what was significant was the rate of decline of lung function, shown here for the combination in blue versus placebo in black and LABA and, and ICS in the middle. So the message here it may very well be that we do not impact on mortality, but we certainly may influence the decline of lung function in, in this large group of patients with COPD. So the role of ICS LABA is not totally taken out of our mix, and we should use some logical approach, thinking that patients who have more of an asthma-like phenotype may benefit more from the inhaled steroids, those that have more of an emphysema phenotype may benefit more from just a lava lama. If you want to prevent exacerbations in individuals who are continuing to exacerbate in, in spite of maximal bronchodilatation or inhaled steroids, there was this large study of azithromycin given 250 milligrams QD over one year, and whether you took steroids or did not take steroids, you took labas or you did not take laba, Azithromycin decreased the rate of exacerbations and increased the time to the first exacerbation as shown in this graph. Now you have to be careful because you can get more hearing problems and this was significantly so for patients on azithromycin. And azithromycin may lead to colonization by resistant organisms which fortunately appear to have no clinical consequences at least in this study. Some studies have suggested some risk of cardiac deaths from azithromycin, but big data reviews have failed to prove so. Well, how do we approach patients since we have such a collection and number of medications? Well, the goal criteria have changed this year, and there is some guidance of how should we approach it. If we think a patient has COPD, we should assess in all of them by spirometry the degree of airflow obstruction and grade them according to these levels because they're associated with a uh, outcome prognosis for survival. The more obstructed, the, more, uh, the higher the risk of death down the road. However, for pharmacotherapy, we should primarily depend on the assessment of symptoms and the risk of exacerbation. And for that, the goal committee has created this grid. It starts with a division of the symptoms as measured by the Medical Research Council scale of dysmia or the COPD assessment test or the CCQ questionnaire in Europe. In the US, we use primarily the two first tests. If your value is two or higher for the MMRC or 10 or plus for CAD, you fall to the right of this line. In essence, more symptoms to the right. And then the same thing for exacerbations. If you have two or more per year, and that is a question you can easily ask in your clinic about how many times a patient has exacerbated the year before your eval, or one or more leading hospital to hospital admission, you're classified in the upper two quadrants. So if you're very symptomatic and you have many exacerbations, you're a D. 
If you are little symptomatic and never exacerbated, you, you enter into the group A. More symptoms without exacerbations on B, more exacerbations without a lot of symptoms on C. And indeed, the goal committee has, and I ask you to please uh, go to the website, www period gold uh, or Google Gold guidelines, and you'll get this graph. This is just published in the Blue Journal, uh, the European Respiratory Journal. And you can get the four suggested algorithms for initiation and continuation of therapy for either of those groups. In essence, you could start with one bronchodilator. You, if the patient doesn't do well, you continue or try an alternative class of bronchodilators. For patients who are very symptomatic, you could start with one, but if the symptoms are a problem, starting with two is not a bad idea. For group C, those that have exacerbations, same as group B, but you can either and preferably use a combination, or you could, if your clinical ju judgment so suggests, use a LABA ICS. And for those that are more severe, your graph is a little more complex, I personally suggest you start with a LAMA plus LAVA, evaluate the results. If the patient continues to exacerbate and is symptomatic, you add the ICS. If, however, that remains a problem, you consider azithromycin, as I said, or a macrolide, and consider roflumilas, which is also another anti-inflammatory that I have not shown you, that in patients with chronic bronchitis reduces exacerbation rate. I have modified this a bit as a clinician. To the left, moderate COPD with relatively preserved lung function. To the right, more severe COPD with more symptoms. And I have superimposed the ABCD in a linear scale. If your patient falls to the left, lifestyle modification, smoking, cessation, and exercise, then you start with a single or dual long-acting bronchodilator. If the patient falls more to the right, lifestyle, smoking cessation, and you can start with a double drug therapy. You check adherence if the patient is not doing well. Consider ICS if no evidence of infected sputum. Increase to triple therapy or add a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. And for patients who have specific problems such as deconditioning, you do rehab, emphysema in the upper lobes, long volume reduction, hypoxemia, you may supplement oxygen and exacerbations which are repeated and uncontrollable azithromycin. Now there is one therapy that we should never forget, and this is rehabilitation. This is a propos of question two that I asked you. Shown here are patients whose FEV1 has not improved on rehab, but look at what they're able to do. And the evidence from many documents, 11 of them, show that when you review the evidence, the grade is evidence A. So anybody who is symptomatic from COPD will benefit from improving their muscle function, their perception of dyspnea, and their quality of life through rehabilitation. And I'm giving you here guidelines that can be accessed so you learn how to do it. Now our group has published these little 10 commandments of COPD. First, we should help eliminate smoking and pollution. That's the first commandment. Second, we should make a diagnosis on anybody who has dyspnea, cough, and sputum by performing a spirometry. We should assess dyspnea, the BMI, functional capacity, by exercise and exacerbation risk. And we should check for certain comorbidities which are very frequent in COPD, heart disease, cancer, osteoporosis, depression, and gastric reflux. For treatment, we should promote vaccination. I didn't mention it as a form of therapy, but indeed, it is very effective in preventing the flu and in sometimes pneumonia that can promote and preserve exacerbations and respiratory failure. We should promote exercise. We should institute a specific therapy, and I've given you the guidelines from GOLD, and we should supervise the correct use of inhalers and medication, which is a practical problem that affects many of our elderly patients. And they should be followed whether they get admitted and discharged or whether they're patients in our clinic, a follow-up to assess response to therapy is crucial. Now, we cannot be negative. Let me show you what happens in three observational studies of patients with COPD that range from three to 10 years. 
shown here is from Casanova in the Bode group, 750 patients followed for 10 years. The majority of patients decline in their lung function as a normal person would, indicating that we've achieved benefit in that group who's now performing like a normal group. Unfortunately, 18% of patients decline rapidly and we have to follow and be more aggressive with those patients. A second study by Jürgen Vesbo from Eclipse with 2,000 patients over three years actually improves the picture. It shows that 7% of the patients improve their lung function over three years. And again, the majority do not change and about 30% decline. And finally, Dr. Nishimura and his group in Japan have shown that following patients over five years, in their hands, the proportion of patients who actually improve is larger, about a quarter. About another quarter deteriorates, which is not too different from these two other studies, and 50% and of the patients have normal decline. So in essence, in COPD, it's not that the majority get worse. The majority do not change too much over time. They just decline as we all do. And actually, a certain percentage of them do improve, and therefore, it is worth our effort. I don't want to close without touching on exacerbations, which are important events in the natural history of COPD. As the patient over time worsens, if he does so, especially the 25% whose lung function worsens over time, there are events that may be precipitated by infections, viral or bacteria, by pollution with acute changes in temperature and in particle contact in the atmosphere, or by emotional or unknown reasons or viral infections, as I said, and the patients develop episodes where the dyspnea becomes intolerable. There may be cough and sputum production and a call to the emergency room to the physician or a visit to the hospital becomes necessary. I'm showing you two patients here, both of whom have an exacerbation. This is a pink puffer, this is a blue bloater, this is intubated. This gentleman has a non-invasive ventilator on him and they do have in common COPD and exacerbations. They can lead to admissions to ICUs and let me just remind you that these patients when admitted to an ICU have a much worse prognosis than a similar patient with heart disease admitted for a heart attack. The, day, the death rate over two years for a heart attack hovers around 5%. The death rate for ventilatory insufficiency in a COPD or admitted to an ICU hovers about 50% over two years. So it becomes crucial that we prevent them. And this is shown here. If you take a cohort of 300 individuals and you look at the probability of survival over time, if you have no exacerbations, your survival probability follows this line. If you have one or two, you're right here, you have three or four, 80% of them will be death within 16 months. So the rate of exacerbation becomes a target of our therapy. And indeed, we are able to prevent them if we use all the resources we have. Taking from the American College of Chest Physician guidelines in just 2015, I have summarized here the odds ratio promoted by giving influenza vaccine, enrolling people in rehab, giving them an action plan, or using different forms of medications. Notice how many of them do improve significantly, as shown by the star and by the confidence interval, <clears throat> the chance or risk of having exacerbations. The only one was theophylline, which did not really make a big difference. But all the other ones appear to improve and decrease your ratio. And certainly combining them as we are physicians should result in improvement. And as I know from data and the literature, the actual rate of exacerbation is relatively low, less than 1% in most of the studies where patients are followed over six months. If you have an exacerbation, this is what I call the pathophysiology. You have worsening of the obstruction and that traps air. This leads for more shortness of breath, which in turn increases the drive to breathe with increase breathing rate, more trapping, more obstruction, and this vicious cycle prompts the patient to ask for help. Now, because there is inflammation, there are systemic effects that even increase the drive to breathe by creating more dyspnea. 
This is the effect of hypoxemia if it develops, temperature, which is a frequent problem, and liberation of endotoxins. Because the diaphragm is flattened in COPD due to hyperinflation and you have to use more the accessory muscles, there is a decrease in the reserve of the respiratory muscles while there is an increase in the load brought about by the obstruction and the systemic effects of the inflammation. So our therapy should be addressed to breaking this cycle. The first thing we can do is we can place the patient at rest, which is frequently what we do when anyone has a cold. We can give them oxygen to try to decrease the hypoxemia that may be increasing drive of breathing, and certainly take care of the temperature and the inflammation by using anti-inflammatories such as acetaminophen or non-sterilized anti-inflammatories. This will certainly help you break the cycle and maybe one of the reasons who people, of people who get exacerbations at home do better when you put them in the hospital. The second component is to treat the pathobiology of the exacerbation. And here we use antibiotics, corticosteroids, and bronchodilators. I'm not going to touch on bronchodilators because I already did so. We use the same kind that we use chronically, but giving them in nebulizations or inhalations more frequently. Or if there is failure of the pump to be able to pump, we can assist that pump with the use of non-invasive or invasive mechanical ventilation. So let me briefly review the data. Are antibiotics useful? If you have fever, chills, high white count, and yellow sputum or green sputum indicating probable bacterial infection, of course antibiotics are helpful. And this is depicted here in this trial that I think will never be repeated. Double blind placebo control randomized, 93 patients given oxyfloxacin versus placebo, outcome death, need for antibiotics or mechanical ventilation, and what I want you to see by all, by all the events, but more so if we look at all of them, there was a benefit on the oxyfloxacin group compared to the placebo group. So uh, to me, there is, I'm sorry, to me there is no question that the administration of antibiotics in patients who need it is vital to be able to improve outcomes. And this is true for any infectious disease of bacterial origin. Now, whether you give them short or long antibiotics is more in question, these are randomized trial and a forest plot showing how many of them have been done. And here, the absolute result is that there is no big difference. So the length of your antibiotic therapy may go as short as five days, as long as 14 days. Most studies show that short may be as good as long. And you are clinicians and you got to use what you think is best for your patient depending on how they are clinically responding. Now, corticosteroids are also helpful. This is shown here by the trials where randomized trials have been done. And you can see here on the right that on average, this being the largest one, there is a favorable odds ratio for the administration of corticosteroids compared to no corticosteroids. But you may pay a price if you leave them too long. If you go over 14 days or 10 days, hyperglycemia, hypertension, anxiety, psychosis may become a problem. Data has shown that if you give five days, it's as good as 14, and larger data has already shown that 14 is much better than long-term corticosteroids. You actually do not have to use a tapering approach. 40 to 50 milligrams of prednisone over five days has been shown in France to be appropriate. Actually, the ACCP in the same uh, issue that I showed you, declare that for patients with acute exacerbation in the outpatient or inpatient setting, we suggest that systemic corticosteroids be given orally or intravenously to prevent hospitalization for subsequent acute exacerbations and to improve clinical outcomes. The grade is to be, but it's sufficient for me to say that most patients will benefit from corticosteroids. And then for non-invasive mechanical ventilation, the data is even stronger. I'm showing you here outcomes for intubation and for mortality from randomized clinical trials. And here, it's got the strongest signal. If you use non-invasive ventilation in patients with COPD who have ventilatory failure, as shown by elevated PCO2 and low pH, non-invasive ventilation is worth the trial, not only to decrease intubation rate, but also to improve mortality. 
So we have therapies that are highly effective, and that is why I think there has been a decrease in admissions to ICU of patients with COPD who used to be a plague 10, 15 years ago. So as we approach the end, I would like to give you my personal conclusions. First, we need to promote healthy lifestyle and bat bat battle against smoking, the first hit for COPD and lung disease, and pollution, which although not as big a problem as it used to be in developed countries, remains a huge problem, specifically in Asia. Number two, there is still a need to improve diagnosis of COPD. The prevalence is high, the consequences are bad, and we need to improve diagnosis if we're to beat this disease. Number three, therapy is effective if well used, and that includes pharmacotherapy. It is your obligation, our obligation, to make sure we teach how to use those inhalers, how to use them appropriately, and indicate those that we believe will be of most help for each individual patient. I please ask you to consider rehabilitation in anybody who remains symptomatic and has decreased quality of life from limitations in their functional capacity. Exacerbations should be prevented, and indeed we have excellent therapies for the acute events, as I have shown you towards the ending of my presentations. And I please ask you to go onwards. The future is ours to build. More medications will be appearing. We have to think outside of the box and address probably areas outside of the thorax, such as the comorbidities that patients may present, such as muscle wasting, nutritional depletion, all of which may be amenable to therapy as we develop medications that can address those issues. And I think there is light at the end of the tunnel. The actual mortality from COPD in the world remains as the third most frequent cause of death, but is beginning to decline. And this is a positive sign that we may be doing what is right for our patients.